and welcome back to On the Workbench. Today we've got an unboxing of the GE 50 gallon GeoSpring a hybrid electric water heater. A couple of things as we begin this unboxing. This is a rather large hot water heater. Uh, it's large in the sense that it's top heavy, so it's a little bit awkward. And so when you, if you get the store and you get in the box, make sure you find the side of the box that says back, because that's the side that you can put down for loading, that you can tip over for moving around and to get in and out of your house uh, down some stairs or whatever you need to do. Uh, one little quirk with the packaging that I thought was interesting is the product weight is listed as between 170 and 180 pounds, which I find a little bit bizarre. I think GE should know exactly how much this box weighs and not have a 10 pound guess uh, for how much is in between. So this is supposedly made in America. America at work is what the label says. It's got the American flag. One of the big advantages of this water heater is in many jurisdictions there's an opportunity for a pretty substantial rebate on this. It makes it cost competitive with a traditional water heater, at least a traditional electric water heater. And so I thought the advantages of that made a lot of sense. And so let's go ahead and open up the packaging. Put on the safety glasses for these band straps. These were very useful for manhandling the packaging at the store. I've got to give, uh, this was purchased at Lowe's, I've got to give them credit for helping me load this into my vehicle. I was able to fit this in the back of a, the equivalent of a Chevy Trailblazer, the Saab 97X. You've probably seen me work on it a few times on my channel doing some other repairs. Works great, and this fits in if you fold down the back seat. As we take off the top, a couple things here to look at coming out of the box. You can see all the styrofoam here. One of the things I'm a little disappointed with is I would have thought there would have been some caps to seal the top here in packaging. As you can see, there's shredded styrofoam around these lines. So I want to make sure I clean that out with a vacuum cleaner. And you know how the, uh, the styrofoam stuff just sticks to your hand like crazy. So I'm a little disappointed at that. We got some stickers up here. Uh, we're going to have to clean that off with a vacuum cleaner. Disappointed already with that in terms of the packaging. You've got a lot of styrofoam packaging and ribs around the box. This is clearly marked rear. You've got a fan here. Come around to the other side. Here's where the big reason for this is. If you look at the energy guide, $220 per year. Uh, this is, I don't actually see it, a year on this energy guide sticker. Just for comparison, the one that this is replacing has an energy guide sticker estimating the cost of this uh, for 58 gallons at $420 a year. And this actually has, based on a 2004 U.S. government uh, energy average of 0 0.086 kilowatts per hour, or I'm sorry, dollars per kilowatt hour. So as we come around here, we've got one of the other extra things on here is there's actually going to be another port here on the back for a condensation drip that has to get plumbed in. That's a little bit different because the way this works with a heat pump at the top, this is going to use some of the ambient heat in the air, sort of like the reverse of an air conditioner to help to uh, heat up your hot water. We've got some settings here to learn how this works of between a heat pump, hybrid, high demand, electric fan off, and vacation mode. And there's an Ethernet port here. There's a special attachment you can use to be able to connect it to a smart grid adapter if your utility supports it. And on the side over here is a quick start guide uh, going over the functions of it. We've got your usual caution stickers and don't be an idiot messages uh, taped to the side of it. We've got an air filter on the side and our user manuals all in a package here. Make sure we save and protect those because we may need those for our rebates. And we've got more styrofoam here to remove. Just like that. We can pull that off. And so because of the heat, the air, the compressor at the top, this is why you got to be careful handling this, that it's going to be top heavy moving around. And so I would recommend leaving the packaging on until you get it all, uh, close to your final position. And so as you look at this, you can see how this uh, comes out of the package. There's already the 
pressure relief valve on the side that's already plumbed in. There is no option that it appears to be able to put that on the top. I know some folks like to have that on the top, but this has it permanently on the side. Doesn't bother me one bit. Access panel there in the below for heating elements. GE logo, red top. Uh, there's a Whirlpool variant of this that has a black top, and there's a Kenmore variant that also has a similar black top to it. I think they're getting ready to discontinue the red. I could be wrong. When it comes to setting up your hot water heater, there's going to be a few tools that you're going to want. First, you're going to want to have a hacksaw available, uh, so you can actually cut if you buy one of the pre-made pressure relief valve downspout tubes. Those are going to be too long for the tank, so you want a hacksaw to be able to cut that to length. You're going to want some sort of an adjustable crescent wrench for working on the fittings. Electrical tape and wire nuts for tying the electricity together. Plumber's tape, of course. Uh, one of the things that I'm surprised they didn't include is this half-inch uh, relief fitting. You'll need one of these on the top for your uh, 220 electric line. It's about 58 cents. I wish they would have included that. I had plenty of extra on hand around the house, no problem. You might want a screwdriver for tightening up the pressure relief. And the most odd tool of them all is a T20 Torx wrench or Torx screwdriver bit, whatever you want to use, because you'll need that to be able to access the electrical connection on top. It baffles me why they didn't actually use a Phillips head. That would have made life so much easier, but at least all the screws on top are T20 Torx. So I just have mine attached, a uh, T20 bit attached to just a simple spinner. No problem. And then you also want some 3 8 inch drain tube. One other tool that you might want, if you call it a tool, is some rags and a bucket or towels. Since you are working with water, having some towels on hand to be able to wipe up your mess is probably a smart idea. So if we come over and look at my setup here, I've got the downspout on the side there. This was originally longer and I had to cut it a little bit shorter with the hacksaw. And then up on top, I've got my fittings all set up here, hot on the left, cold on the right. 220 coming out with the strain relief. We've got the fitting here on top, or the uh, screen on top. And then on the back, you're supposed to have about 7 inches. I've got less than 7 inches here for the way I've got the set. According to the instructions, you need seven inches to be able to remove uh, these panels here for service in the event of service. My solution would be to simply disconnect the hot water heater and just move it to an easier place to get to. Uh, you also have a condensation line that you have to be able to run to a drain. And it comes with this T, which is a half-inch NPT thread into the back. And at the top here to be able to have the air pressure going down as a vent. And that goes down into your floor drain to be able to drain off the condensation. This mine is located by my furnace. That just goes right into the same drain as my furnace condensation line, or the air conditioning line for my furnace goes. And the tank took probably about a half hour to set up, no problem, or at least to fill. I'm getting ready to turn the power on for the first time, and I'll let you watch the hot water heater go through its cycles as I turn on the electricity for the first time. You want to make sure you get your tank completely full of water according to the instruction guide, and then go through the process of flipping on uh, your hot water heater. So I'm going to go to the breaker box, flip the switch. I have my camera here on this so you can watch live uh, how it responds. It'll take a couple minutes to boot up and get things ready. It's supposed to spit out an error code if there's not water in the tank. Make sure you check out your instruction guide.
done with your setup, take your user manual to add it to your, man, your set of household manuals that go with your house. In the event you sell your home, wherever you need to refer to it again, you'll have it nice and handy. And especially if you ever think about selling your home, you want to make sure you got all your permanent appliances and all the manuals together. It'll just add extra value for the resale price of your house. I hope you found this video useful today, and have a great day. Bye.